Lit Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Well, a very good afternoon and welcome to Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales and you're listening to The Profile, a very special edition of The Profile because I'm down in sunny Bournemouth to meet my guest today. It's Dave Griffiths. Dave is a musician, singer, songwriter and many other things that we'll delve into into this interview. We're actually sitting where Dave records a number of his uh, albums and projects. You may be familiar with him from the Christian band Bosch and more latterly, Chaos Curb collaboration, as well as his solo projects. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So here we are. We've got the heater on uh, <laughs> in a fairly um, in a decent-sized room, um, but the location is pretty special. Do you want to tell us about the building that is opposite where we're sitting? Yeah. Uh, well, we're sat right now in a, a shed, effectively, but it's got power, which is <laughs> handy, but it doesn't have a loo. Um on the site of the Apostolic Faith Church, and which the, the building just opposite us here uh, was the very first purpose-built Pentecostal church, definitely in the United Kingdom, but I've heard arguably maybe the world, because wow. it was built just in the, in the wake of the Welsh Revival uh, in 1907. And I believe, although Azusa Street happened, I think, just prior to that, they didn't build anything to the bit after okay. this. So, yeah, that's the kind of the historical first context. Pentecostal church possibly in the world. Church building, yeah. Is metres away from where we're sat now. And you've had some involvement in this church. In fact, you were the pastor for a couple of years, weren't I you? I was, I was. Tell yeah. me about that. Duncan is the chief apostle of the Apostolic Faith Church globally. And very kindly, he offered, he said, would you like to come and train with me and, and help me with the church? But I was very committed to... Uh, the church I grew up in and and was working with at the time, just around the corner, Bournemouth Community Church. It just wasn't the right time. There was lots of reasons it wasn't the right time. So I said no. Um, But then fast forward to 2015, Mm -hmm. and everything changed. And he was another 10 years older, and he's 87 now. Wow. Amazing man. I love very, very much. And uh, he asked me, he said, I really need some help, you know, and I was in a position in my life where actually I could. So I ended up being involved here for two years as a kind of pastor um, and preaching and things. And it was a fantastic two years. And uh, But it just sort of naturally came to an end where I felt that I should go and finish a degree I'm doing, a yeah. theology degree. But I needed a placement church and I needed that church to be offering a lot more. Mm. And I've been humming and hawing about Church of England things for a while. And so currently I'm actually part of the local parish learning the ropes with the Church of England. And you're heading, as I understand it, hopefully into an exciting new, what's what sort of dubbed fresh expression of a different kind of church. You're going to be looking to reach out to students in Bournemouth. That's right. So the deanery have said, we need to do something for the students where they live. And they live in this parish. So we're going ahead and starting something in September, um, probably based around food. So we're calling it The Table. And um, yeah, just kind of trying to do something that serves the student population. We always like here on the profile to go back to the very beginning and ask someone about their life growing up. But before we get there, I did want to talk just uh, once more about this this church um, where we're sitting. Because you have an amazing testimony um, involving kind of church unity and reconciliation and trying to bring people together. And I think that was when um, when you were pastoring this church. So do you want to tell us that story of this denominational split that happened and how you were able to be a part of some reconciliation that went on? Sure. Uh, So... The Apostolic Faith Church was the first church, uh, Pentecostal church, to be uh, organised in in this country. Um, But sadly, it wasn't long before, you know, church politics set in and there's splits and things. And um, in 1916 at a conference, there was a split between Oliver, William Oliver Hutchinson, who is the guy who initiated the whole thing. And he had some elders called the Jeffreys Brothers, I think. Mm -hmm. And they just disagreed with him about how the offering that was taken should be spent. So there sadly became a a split. And the Apostolic Church was born. So this is the Apostolic Faith Church. Right outside this building. Yeah. And then the Apostolic Church, so minus the faith bit, was started by these brothers Uh, back in 1916. Now, fast forward to the summer of 2016, and I'm playing at, uh, I'm doing a gig at New Wine. And I got talking to uh, a a friend of a friend called Rhiannon, and she's she's Welsh, 
and she's part of an apostolic church. And we just ended up talking about um, the fact that I was with the apostolic faith church and she was the apostolic church. Yeah, we got talking and it emerged that their centenary um, conference was coming up uh, up at Cheltenham, the race course. So it kind of got me thinking, um, wouldn't it be great if uh, we could reach out? Yeah. The Apostolic Faith Church could reach out to the Apostolic Church a hundred years on from the split. And I made some phone calls and I ended up getting a ring uh, come through on my, my phone from Tim. And Tim is the fairly newly appointed um, head, you know, chief apostle, whatever you want to call it, of the Apostolic Church globally, but he's based here in the UK. And he rang me very excited and said, oh, I got your message. Uh, it'd be amazing if um, if we could meet up. Would you like to come to the conference, to the centenary wow. celebration? And there'd be next to no sort of talking none. or grouping between none. these two churches since the split a hundred years ago. Yeah, wow. none. In fact, they've been giving each other a wide berth, right. sadly. So um, so this was brilliant. This was, felt really timely. And he arranged for me to be a guest. So I, I went up there and ended up on the front row there in the conference with probably, I'd say, four or 5,000 people from the Apostolic Church from across the world who had gathered to celebrate, you know, 100 years of their movement. And um, I took a gift. I took a, one of our hymnals. It's a little red book, and it's full of our hymns that we sing in the church, and it's like 93 years old. It was published in the 20s. Um, but we still use them. So I thought this is a little token of um, from us, you know, just to give a peace offering. But I also knew that the split was about money. So I actually took some money with me as well as a sort of a gesture. Um, just, I don't know, it just felt like the right thing. So we ended up sat there, you know, myself, and um, then there was Tim, and he had two or three regional apostolic church leaders with him. And we ended up having this amazing hour together at the conference. And honestly, there was not a dry eye in that little circle. We were just really moved. And it felt like God's presence was really sort of tangible. It's just really emotional. Especially, I guess, as this was a 100-year celebration, which is understandable for that church. One to celebrate 100 years of being around. But the sad element of that being that they only existed 100 years ago because they split away from yeah. the church that you were representing so for you yeah. to be at that conference and for there to be some display of unity is quite remarkable it was and I kind of feel emotional thinking about it actually um, and, and what happened after that was that Tim and some of these regional guys came down um, and visited here and we sat around in, in a small circle and we prayed and it just felt very healing mm. really really something I feel privileged to have have been witness to really so there's relationship there where there wasn't before Um, and you know AOG and Elim are also sort of offshoots from this original route here amazing stuff well as I said we do uh, we do like to go back to the beginning here on the profile and ask Mm. someone about their early life and that's normally my first question Dave but you've been so interesting that we've got sidetracked from that but I want to hear right up front your story from the beginning so did you grow up in a Christian family? I did yeah I want to pay tribute really to my parents because they're just amazing people very faithful people and um, they they've been on a journey themselves in terms of you know they both grew up in in church Uh, My dad in quite a sort of strict Baptist type setting and my mum in the Church of England. And they they met at a kind of ecumenical youth group um, where all the different young people from different churches in in Westbury in Wiltshire um, got together and hung out. And uh, they met through that. They got married fairly young, had me fairly young. Um, They lived in Reading when I was born and attended quite a strict Baptist church there. But they always felt like maybe there was something more to this Holy Spirit thing. So they had a secret home group that was sort of tentatively exploring the things of the Spirit on the down low. How rebellious. Yeah. <laughs> but that that meant that when we moved to Bournemouth, they were looking for a church that were moving in that way. Yeah. And so settled at what became Bournemouth Community Church. And weirdly, that's another offshoot of this church. Wow. Yes, yeah, so it's all connected. Um I mean, um, how, it's amazing how many people would even guess that possibly the first Pentecostal church in the world is in Bournemouth of all places. And in the, in the backwaters of Bournemouth. We're not central here. We're in a suburb. But this, this was all fields. And they bought the, the plot and built the building. So the houses are subsequent to the church. But anyway, yeah, so mum and dad moved to Bournemouth and my brother and sister and I grew up here. 
in church and you know there's so many great things about yeah. that you know yeah and, and I guess fairly quickly you got into music and um, you're still very well known for uh, being in a couple of bands at least and of playing various sort of types of Christian music Bosch for a long time you were touring around the UK playing a lot of youth groups playing in that and, uh, and also Chaos Curve collaboration which I've just been privileged to hear some demos of because there's some new material on the way. But tell us about how all that came about. Was it was it Bosch, first of all, this kind of Christian band that you and your brother, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So my dad built a studio in a shed, weirdly, ah. actually. Not um, this shed. Not one. this one, no, no, another <laughs> one. Um, with his friends, recorded an album. Uh, this was in the mid-90s. Um, so home recording sort of stuff was still quite primitive, but they, they, they did it. They got equipment together and soundproofed this shed and, and recorded an album and uh in the summer of 96 um i'd been b- beginning to muck about a bit on the piano and write little tunes and i i said dad could, could we go in the studio and record a song and he sort of said yes and and him and uh, his friend john who's become a close friend of mine actually too um they they had me and my brother and sister um in this shed and we recorded a song and we called the the band Bosch. Um, that doesn't mean anything, the word Bosch, at all, really. I, I got the bug, and I was, I think, 12? Wow. Very and I just threw myself into... The next few years was just all about whatever equipment I could get my hand on. So, like, uh, the Tascam 4-track uh, to record on little chrome tapes, and I would borrow microphones and whatever I could from people at church or whatever. And as I got older at school, I got to know other people in my year who were into music. And don't forget, this is the, the 90s, so guitar music's everywhere. Yeah. You know, um, I'm an early teenager and Brit pops everything. And I'm massively into it, you know, just consuming so much music all the time and mucking about with home recording stuff. And it Bosch just kept going, it kept evolving. We put together these little tapes of the stuff we were doing on the four tracks and then I worked all summer when I left school and bought a digital eight track and we made CDs and then after that we started to get into studios and other people joined the band and we became this gigging unit and all the while my faith was getting more serious. Christian band but it, I guess it turned into an evangelistic type rock band and we'd go around yeah, doing these gigs and telling people about God's love really yeah. through the songs and that went on for years 15, 15. years 15 talking just before actually about how there was a kind of a scene for this but I remember in the in the late 90s early noughties I was a teenager to give my age away and um, weirdly enough I was going to uh, gigs including a, a few Bosch gigs in fact I would have seen you on stage as a teenager and there was a kind of culture in a lot of youth groups of a Christian band whether overtly evangelistic or not whether worship or not but some a group of Christians making music will turn up in a lot of churches across the country play gigs and people will turn up um, and we were talking just a few moments ago about how some of that seems to have lot, been lost and there's not a lot of that around anymore. What are the reasons for that? And are they the same reasons that you stopped after 15 years? Uh, good, good question. I mean, in, in a way I stopped that band. Yes, that band stopped. But actually, in a way we didn't because we became Chaos Curb, essentially. So Bosch evolved into Chaos Curb, um, took on new people and there's was a, a rejig. But, I mean, you're right, all around us, the scene was changing, the landscape was shifting hugely, 
And, you know, we were at a stage with Bosch where we were doing a church gig every week um, for about three or four years around the southwest mainly, but but the whole nation. And we got to the point where we were going overseas a little bit. And there was just this great um, fraternity uh, across the country and people got to know each other. And, you know, we used to do a lot of gigs with other bands around our age, like Dweeb and Brother John. And it, a lot of very close friendships were formed. And there just seemed to be this uh, understanding in the church that music can minister to people, encourage people. And not just worship music as no, well. Because exactly. you were never really playing worship music per se. Yeah, that's right. Bosch was never a worship band. No, I mean, we could do it and we did do it. We were all playing in worship bands on Sunday. But our remit was never really to go and lead worship so much as to tell people about, you know, express something of mm. God's love and and communicate through the songs like hope and um, challenge people maybe even a little bit too and there was a bit of self-expression in there as well so yeah I mean there's lots of other bands like that like I mentioned you know at the time I suppose in the wake of Delirious Mm -hmm. um, there were there were lots of young people that grew up going to Delirious gigs seeing bands like that that could really play and rock out but loved the Lord and just had this heart Um, and I, I think they they inspired a generation to go and do it and it took lots of different forms. I mean, you'd never think that Dweeb sounded like Delirious. No. But the, the whole heart of it was very similar. But I think, you, as you rightly say, things changed. I think that's partly because of the financial meltdown in 2008. I think there's a lot less cash in churches. And they were feeling the pinch and maybe feeling a bit more aware of how they were spending. And so stopped spending out on bands and doing, a, doing large-scale events and hiring PA and lighting and all that kind of stuff. But I think also young people started to consume music quite differently. It was less about the live experience, more about streaming things online. And maybe what was going on in the pop charts wasn't so guitar based. So guitar music wasn't as cool. You know, because at the same time, there were people coming through like Governor B and, and, and guys like that who were making music that is more urban and more electronic in its nature. And he's just, he's been very popular. And, and so that it has shifted a little bit, I think. And we should say as well that, that when it kind of transitioned or you moved on to, to Chaos Curb, you know, you had some fantastic reviews from uh, the likes of Cross Rhythms and, and others who are reviewing Christian music. You were incredibly well received, as I remember it, of Chaos Curb collaboration, certainly the, the first record you put out. So tell me a bit about that. What was, what was similar to Bosch and what was different? Um, was it more of a worship direction? Was it a change in sound? What, what happened there? definitely some differences um even though like i say some of the personnel were the same but we also brought in other musicians so like tim orford from dweeb who was the front man of dweeb played drums in chaos curve and we had some of the dweeb guys play on the first album and stuff yeah so it was a, it was a more collaborative thing whereas bosch was sort of this group of people whereas with chaos curve i wanted to throw the doors open and just get my friends involved tim juck even played on the first the old uh keyboard player in Delirious yeah he he I don't think he's done anything musical since Delirious other than played on a track on the first Chaos Curve album which I'm fairly proud of but certainly I was writing songs less to reach out to people who never heard about Jesus Mm -hmm. but actually to to express something to Jesus and I suppose Chaos Curve's always been my contribution to the worship sound in the UK Oxygen that we breathe, the mighty presence, sustenance of life. You are more than we can realize or understand. So high above us, yet you know. And yeah, like you say, I mean, I was really 
really encouraged with how both of the albums went down with reviewers and, and sort of the Christian press in this country uh, and a little bit overseas. Um, but it's, I've always felt most comfortable on the fringes of things. I didn't ever expect to be the next Delirious or Rand or Matt Redman or anything. I prefer to be in the weird kind of places where we've got one foot in the pub on Saturday night and one foot in the church on Sunday morning. So it's kind of like Chaos Curve's done stuff outside of church with playing bars and pubs as well as church events and festivals and things. That's where I'm most comfortable. It's, it's not always easy being there because I'd love to have just been one thing. In some ways, it makes, it makes life easier if you can just define yeah. yourself as, oh, I'm just a worship leader, or oh, I'm just a performer. But when you feel there's a bit of both, and there are other guys like me, like Mark James, for example, that have a huge heart to play to people outside of church and to serve the people inside the church. Do you think the church understands that? Does there need to be more support for Christians who don't just feel cool to make worship music but want to have a foot in both camps? I think it's a general thing. So, yeah, I think it would be great if the church understood that there are a lot of people who see music as a language in which they can express themselves in the church and and worship, but also feel that it's a voice, a way of having a voice outside of the church and expressing their faith there too. We we have lost something of that, I think, in this country. Um, but I think when I say it's a, it's a more general thing, I'm thinking about how someone might be a brilliant teacher and serve diligently in their local ch- school and then but also teach on a Sunday morning at church. Just generally, we all have a foot in probably both camps yeah. unless you're a full-time Christian and there are a few that's okay that's all right but but most people I think probably do have a foot in in a setting that is more and I hate this word but this more secular setting a more mm-hmm. this is my world context and then this is how I serve within the body of Christ and believers that gather to worship together and and yeah. have that family connection of faith. I guess you're doing that uh, even now. So am I right in thinking there is some more Chaos Curb stuff possibly uh, on the way? Yeah, we. what's happened has been amazing. Essentially, why why we didn't do a follow-up Chaos Curb album sooner, we did, we did Chaos Curb 1 in 2012 and then almost immediately started working on what became Everywhere, which came out in 2014. And then we did a tour with Martin Smith around club venues so that was really interesting because that was worshippers going to mainstream music venues so we did that and then the following year we could have made another album but I I made a solo album Um, uh, part of the reason for that was that as a band the the four of us um, that were gigging as Chaos Curb collaboration in 2015 all four of us were going through mental health struggles, uh, struggles like quite significant ones um, brought on by various personal circumstances and things. Well, not just that, but chemical imbalances and the rest of it. Um, it's never just one thing. But we'd formed this WhatsApp group, like a support group basically, which functions to this day and is a safe place for any of us to be brutally honest about how we're doing. And so what has emerged is a very, very deep friendship between the four of us that are the, the, the Chaos Curb band four of us have become extremely close closer than I've really ever been in any band in terms of just how vulnerable we are with each other um but what now needs to happen is for that to to take on a musical form and it's going to take a little while to figure out exactly what that needs to look like but yeah, there's new there's new stuff that I'm demoing and writing very specifically for Chaos Curb collaboration. It's often the case that the music that most hits home with people, you dig below the surface and you realise it actually came out of a period of adversity or trial or suffering or difficulties. Often it is the music that comes out of those difficult places that has the most profound impact on people. Yeah, almost every big worship song just to take worship songs as an example, because it's it's true in every form of songwriting, but, you know, things like Blessed Be Your Name, Matt Redman, or um, When Silence Falls by Tim Hughes, or Our God Reigns, like Martin's song. You know, loads of these have come out of, like, proper, proper struggle. Mm. And uh, dark places, places of grief, places of loss. Um, 
And I think that's vital uh, for not just for songwriters to express themselves, but also for the church to find the language in our worship life to reflect back. I don't know how to put it, the, 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 the struggle, the, the, the more desperate end of, it, of things where there just seems to be questions rather than answers. And again, that's somewhere I feel very comfortable, actually. Not that it is comfortable to be there, but it is somewhere I've got used to. And I'm happy to express myself. My latest EP that I put out is all stuff from processing depression and anxiety and and my faith sort of questioning and doubt and fear and all sorts of stuff that's mainly negative. But trying to sort of find a prayer, find a song in that stuff, find a prayer song. <laughs> and... Um, even though it's kind of buried under loads of scrawling feedback, it is still there. The latest EP just released under your name, isn't it? Yeah, it's called The Brutal Years. The Brutal Years. It's just a reflection on sort of three years of struggle. Years. interested that you talk about that whatsapp group where you know you and your friends can have these deep conversations because i've spoken to people before who will talk about their own mental health problems or talk more broadly about the church and sort of still say this is this is quite a misunderstood thing or this is yeah. still something there isn't really support for so was that your experience and maybe that's why this sort of group has been so special to you yeah i think none of us have found church to be the place to have when i say church i mean the sunday morning service or or even home group um, I won't say who, but some of us don't go to church uh, to a Sunday morning thing. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a why, desperate... Why, why is that? I mean, what's what's going on on a Sunday... Or what's not going on on a Sunday morning in a home group that should be? Or, or what's gone wrong there? What's gone wrong? Has it ever been right? That's what I want to know. Has there ever been a church that's been a true forum for brutal honesty... I mean, hopefully that has. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to pretend like I know how church has always been done or or how each church operates. Hopefully there's lots of churches. Hopefully there's people listening to this going, my church, my <laughs> church is a great church that does that and is my home group is where I become emotionally vulnerable and go there. But for, for I think for the four of us and for probably lots of other people church has actually rather been a place where you turn up and you participate in the prescribed service plan you worship and you pray maybe and you hear a sermon and you have a brief chat with your friends but it's still that maybe it's a cultural thing too being British or English more specifically because I, I think maybe the Scots and the Welsh are more emotionally available than we Stiff are sometimes. Stiff upper lip and all that stuff. Yeah, and maybe even Southern English, to be even more specific. Like, is it is it Southern English men like me that find it very hard to talk about feelings? Maybe it is. Um, so maybe that's why it doesn't happen so much in, in the churches we go to that are, met, are led by men like us, generally. Maybe we need more women in leadership to initiate more emotional language don't want to be too prescriptive about what gender roles do at all I mean but I just find often that um, men don't do well at talking about their feelings and it's it's tragically uh, borne out in the statistics mm. about um, you know everything from depression to even suicide it's young men isn't yeah. it um, it's even to the point that people have said this is becoming an epidemic and and like you say you would hope that a church would be a, a counter-cultural place where there is an openness and a sense that you can say anything and this is and this is safe. Um, and yet you're not the only one, but there are people sounding the alarm here and saying this isn't quite what we've created for, us, for ourselves. Yeah, I think there's a desperate need for society to do it generally, and we're getting better at it. I mean, even the Prince, and, um, the Prince of Wales and Prince Harry, they're doing much better at bringing this to the conversation. My hero, musically, Graham Coxon from Blur, the guitar player, He's just done a whole thing about like mental health and chatting, and he, chatting about how you're doing. And yeah. it's like, oh, this is becoming more visible, but we definitely need to carry that on in the church and, and in the communities of faith. 
You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. That was the first half of my interview with the musician Dave Griffiths. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. Billy Graham was the man who preached to millions. Don't miss this month's Premier Christianity tribute magazine to our generation's greatest evangelist with photos, interviews and features on his life and legacy. Plus our exclusive interview with Franklin Graham, son of Billy. Krish Kandaya reveals why the cross is bigger than you think and we investigate the Easter miracle of holy fire in Jerusalem. All that plus much more. Ask for your free copy of our Billy Graham tribute magazine at premierchristianity.com slash free sample. The Profile You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales, and today it's a special edition of the show. I'm down in Bournemouth talking to Dave Griffiths. Let's listen in to the second part of my interview with the musician and singer-songwriter. You've been very open and honest about some of the the struggles you've had over the last few years. Alongside that, I don't know if it's the same thing or something similar has been happening, which is often put under this term of deconstruction. Um, this idea that people will look at their faith anew and kind of pull it apart yeah. and wrestle with it and lay it all out on the table, take a fresh look and then try and rebuild it. And and you actually posted something, um, I think on social media just recently, where you said that quite a long process of deconstruction for you is over and you are now reconstructing again. Yeah. Can we go back to the beginning and talk about what brought on the deconstruction in the first place and what that looked like for you? Because it's, it's a really interesting idea and one that not everyone will be familiar with. Yeah, um, well, I mean, my, my questions started because I, you know, I grew up in a very evangelical church, which has so many good things about it, and I do not want to be someone that just sits there and slanders it. Um, but I was give, I was taught a lot of answers, but I don't think life's always that simple, and you know, things happen, and you start to question those answers because they just don't seem to work anymore. Um, so I started to question some things. I mean, the the biggie for me, the biggie for me, has always been an eternal hell, an eternal destination where most people, it would seem, by evangelical standards anyway, are destined to to be tortured forever. That's too horrific to live with for me. And, you know, the argument is, oh, I'm just bending my theology to fit my... Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but honestly... Part of my mental health problems have been down to that. And some of the things that um, are often too glibly talked about Mm -hmm. in certain circles, when actually the idea is beyond horrific, Mm -hmm. like indescribably horrific. So that turned into bad news, not good news. So I had to question things. I had to take things apart for my own well-being. And then other things happen in my life, close people to me, very close people to me, um, chucked their faith completely, almost overnight, it seemed to me. Just walked away, just let it go. And so I, I was left thinking, well, what is this thing then, if it can be just left seemingly by the side of the road and you just carry on? So it began a very deep process of challenging and I did this very publicly as you know as you know we've known each other for a few years and social media affords us an opportunity to process things Mm. very publicly you have a very public platform yeah you do and and uh and so I found that helpful to take these things and go okay what about this Mm. and okay I think I will confess you know I probably overdid it and I probably was far too um there's too much emotion in there at times and I know I hurt people, and for that I'm sorry, but I had to wrestle with these things. And I, I'm an extrovert, mm-hmm. so I like to process things outwardly. outwardly. Yeah. And so I, I did that for for several years. But this I resulted. Realized... I mean, this resulted in some, from my point of view, some really fascinating conversations as well. And sure, yeah. you know, we all know, and I can talk as much as as, as you about how often online the tone isn't great and I've I've spoken before about how I've I've got that wrong and the way I've engaged with people <laughs> and had to apologise they say that got way too heated but the, the thing is about social media as you say it does offer you this public platform to kind of open up a debate yeah. 
about subjects which maybe it is uncomfortable to bring up on a Sunday morning, certainly publicly. And yet there is this space on Facebook where we can talk about these things. I've heard a number of pastors tell me that Facebook is the best thing because they find out so much more about their congregation <laughs> than they I do on imagine. a Sunday morning because people just confess and open up. And, and so, as I say, this resulted in a number of kind of online debates and discussions that you were kind of hosting where you were just opening things up for discussion. What about this? What mm. about that? As I say, I do think it was helpful actually for me. But actually, these things I think should have a lifespan and... I got to a point where I realised within myself that I'd probably done that enough and I didn't want to continue to air every going concern running through my head because I had to try and find a way of processing some of this a little bit more privately and a little bit more internally. I noticed generally more peace within myself since leaving yeah. particularly the Facebook debates and things. Not to say that I won't, won't ever go and post something that initiates conversation again. Because I love conversation. I absolutely treasure those times when you... And we do it online, but it's even better in person. Um, when we chat things yeah. through. So, so you were laying, laying things out. And, and presumably in this, in this process, you changed your mind on particular theological issues or things you thought about God. Can you talk us through a, cu- a couple of things that kind of changed for you in that in that period? <sighs> Yeah, the reason I'm reticent is because a lot of this still isn't settled in my mind. Everything just gets bigger. The more you... Is it Paul Weller who's saying about the more you know, the less you understand? I think studying theology does that a little bit and realising that there's just so many opinions. So, But to, to be more specific, you know, I feel like I'm more confident that love really, really is the answer and exactly how that works I don't know I mean my experience of God stuff is always always love it's hard to superimpose this character that I've learned about called God from scripture and things all the stuff that he gets up to in the stories to 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 uh, to to put that together with some of the experiences I've had and and testimony I hear I don't particularly subscribe to certain, certainly things like an inerrant, infallible Bible, but I do believe it's inspired, and it's there's there's a polyphony of voices there, and there's a conversation happening between things like religion and revelation, and sacrifice and violence and peace. The other thing that's happened more recently, as you say, is you've studied theology um, at a Bible college, yeah. and I guess that's one of the things, arguably, this process of deconstruction. For a lot of people, can happen at college when suddenly you are. Yeah, it started when I went the first time right. in 2012, really. That's where the genesis of my confusion sort of started to set in. Because even though what they were saying and sort of teaching was in line with what I was hearing at church, I felt a dissonance there between, you know, a lot of what they were saying and how I was, where I was having doubts was it was it almost that the more you looked into stuff the less clear it became or or the less certain you became of it you realize it was more complicated yeah and and it's it's how some of these things can kick you off you know thinking about something and you do the required reading but then you start to read a bit wider right yeah and you you realize there's other opinions and you think okay well what do i think then i know what i think i think or what I've been told to think, but I don't really know what I think. And it's finding that difference between, I've got beliefs, but they change, and how fickle belief is, but how sort of underneath there's this faith, there's this trust in a bigger, loving plan that I believe has manifested in Jesus. And and that's still ultimately my bottom line faith. We ran a feature in the magazine recently about um, how theology college changed my life. And there were wonderful stories about how it had been a very positive experience. People had found their calling there or, or things had been answered. But it, it was interesting that um, some of the people um, who contacted, uh, contacted us around yeah. that time actually had quite a different story. And so actually for me, when I went to, to college or when I went to, theological, um, mm. when I went to university to study theology... Yeah it actually threw a load of stuff up that I wasn't anticipating or expecting and, and not all of it was in a good way. Now, now clearly you've called yourself a Christian and yeah. you haven't become an atheist, no. but for some people, <laughs> when they look into this stuff, 
it doesn't lead them in in the same direction and i wonder if that's part of the reason sometimes people are scared oh you know can we look at that hot topic what's it going to do to me yeah i think that reminds me of what rob bell said in in his first book velvet elvis about how doctrines are often treated like bricks that form this wall and if you take a brick out it unstabilizes the wall and he says actually maybe they're more like springs in a trampoline that help us sort of get higher and I love that that's stuck with me and maybe I'm just a product of a postmodern generation I'm open to that I can't help when I was born generation zenial do they call it between generation x and generation y there's a few years of people like me that were born just at the wrong time or right time. That, <laughs> I'm sure it was the right time. You know, I'm not a digital native. Okay, you know, so you're not quite a millennial? Is that no, it? I don't think I'm quite a millennial. But, but underneath, what I'm trying to get to is a, the flow that runs underneath all of the conscious thinking to the point where down here, like on the riverbed, there's a stillness and there's an implicit trust in, in the big plan. And I'm definitely not an atheist. Like, I... What I call God is that creative, connecting love and awareness. There's a level to humanity and to reality that that exists there. And I believe that's the divine Mm. nature. And I definitely believe that it came to us in the form of Christ and showed us the mystery revealed, as it were. Yeah. But, you know, there there are some Christians who who don't like what you're saying now. And they'll say, but you're you're being too wishy-washy. You're being too liberal and... Actually, you need to have this exact view of the cross that Jesus came and he died in your place for your sins and, and there was a sacrifice and there was an atonement. Yeah. And, you know, you may not sign up to that. And, and there are Christians who would say that's a real problem. You know, how, how, do you, how do you respond to that sort of criticism? You must have encountered it. Yeah, I definitely have. And um, I sympathise with it, actually, because for so many years I thought that way, too. Ultimately, I can only be honest. I can only be honest with how I'm feeling about things and, and where I feel there are dissonances and problems and I'm just okay. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. And I'm also okay with people that structure things more formally and more, more I don't black know, and white. More, maybe more black and white. I do respect that. And, and I don't ever want to say, Oh look, I'm right here. That's definitely not what I'm trying to say. Ultimately, I hope there's more that we agree on than that we don't agree on. Mm. Um, so but I'm often the guy going, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by sacrifice? What do you mean by for our sins? And it's that thinking that's led me to so much, well, study of my own, but also trauma <laughs> <laughs> and disagreement and beautiful yeah. conversations and beautiful friendships. I just, well, I just don't want to be that difficult guy but at the same time I just want to be honest yeah. too. so what would you say to um, 18 year old Dave if you could go back in time do you know I was asked that not that long ago actually and I said don't put so much of your identity into church like because church defined me really not Jesus or or my faith so much but who I was in that community and wanting to remain the golden boy And it just was never going to work out for me. So if I could let him off the hook a little bit, stop trying so hard to belong and to be a good boy. 18-year-old me was extremely zealous, and in some ways I missed that intensity. But I also, you know, I had amazing times. I wouldn't change encounters with God. I kind of like him, but I think he'd do my head in a little bit as well <laughs> you're, a, you're a different person and I guess your faith has changed and from what you're saying will continue to change I would be surprised if it didn't yeah. how would you describe uh, your calling today weirdly enough that's what I'd have in common in a way with 18 year old me is that despite sometimes prolonged periods of doubt and anger and frustration with reality and my perception of reality I still want to see my life and everyone else's lives changed by love. Changed. And I do believe that essence, the essence of God, if we're going to get technical, I'd love to get technical, just a little bit, theology-wise. I'll let you off, go on. There's two axiomatic phrases in the New Testament about okay. what God. What does axiomatic mean? Axiomatic, Greek, a- axiom, like undeniable truth. Okay. 
axiomatic. So two phrases that are undeniable truths about God. Mm -hmm. God is love and God is light. Those are two statements in the New Testament. It doesn't say God is anything else. I, I don't think anyway. You might get letters to the contrary. That's fine. I, but, but those two are very important to me. God is love and God is light. So if if the missio day, the mission of God in my life is still to help people connect. My big word is connection. All my life I've looked for connection. All my life that connection has been, you know, something I've gone after with God and with other people. And I guess with myself too. In that place of connection, experiencing love and experiencing light, that's it. I still want that. And I believe Jesus, the resurrected Christ, brings that. He just brings love, light, connection. So my, my everything I communicate ultimately will still probably boil down to that. That's my greatest hope. My greatest hope is that at the end of all things... When you boil it all down, all will be connected to love and light. And people throw words at me like, you yeah, know, universalist and things. Um, so a universalist yeah. would believe that ultimately, somehow, one day, God will win everyone to paradise, heaven, eternity with him, and no one will be outside of that in hell or any kind of disconnection from God. I can hope that. I can't... I mean, that's quite... Yeah... I would call myself a universal reconciliationist. Okay. And what I mean by that is I do believe in the end all things will be reconciled. For God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So, yeah, I think that's something I'm allowed to hope for. I respect other views. I've got close, close friends that don't believe that. And I know the whole argument of, well, what's the point then? Well, love is the point anyway. Really, mm. like we can experience it now. Yeah. So why wouldn't you want that for for yourself and for your, for for humanity, for the for creation? Why wouldn't you want reconciliation? We, like Paul says, isn't it? Two Corinthians. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. You've been reconciled, therefore be reconciled. Totally, totally gets my heart beating faster. Still, my raison d'être in the world mm. is that. Tell me a bit more about how that's uh, practically outworked, because I know you're all over this local area doing um, stuff in pubs and <laughs> clubs and live music. And it's, as we were saying earlier, it's not this isn't just a church thing for you. You aren't just interested in solely confining yourself to Christian music or playing in churches, but you're out there in the in the world as well, meeting yeah. people and doing stuff. So tell me more about that and how that kind of fits in with, with your kind of calling at the moment. Well, I guess music's been there all the time it's, it's always been this dual track of church involvement and music and music takes a few forms i run several showcase open mic type nights across dorset every month in some great venues and i go out and play either on my own or with my band in pubs and clubs and weddings and all sorts so that's like thursday to sunday night that's my that every night that's what i'm doing and it's really coming down to the same things. Connection, connection, connection. Always friendships, meeting people, getting to know them, looking to be a friend. Uh, sounds kind of cliche and cheesy, but I kind of want to be that guy that people can relate to and isn't seen as so holy over here with his you know, churchy things that he can't be 100% there and relatable and present with people in their situations that I'm finding through friendship out in these places and that can be landlords of pubs it could be waiters and waitresses in venues it could be the musicians that come and play my own band members whoever um i hope if i got hit by a bus tomorrow and died i hope people would say he just i just felt like he cared about me that's really all i want is for people to remember me as that guy i love increasingly being with my own kids and just learning from them and experiencing life again through the eyes of my children who are um, 10, 7 and 4 and and learning about life living with my wife. We've been married 13 years this year, still feels new, still feels fresh. She She's my best friend. So it's all kind of that connection wherever it is and whatever level it's on and whatever status you want to put on that. Mm. 
um, even people on Twitter or or Facebook that yeah. I've never met in person, I'm finding you can connect mm. on quite deep levels. What's been the best day of your ministry or your career, and what's been the worst day? A bunch of us grew up totally inspired by Delirious and Martin Smith. The power of that, the music was powerful, but there was something else. The Delirious days were really quite remarkable, weren't they? I mean, to think you had a overtly Christian band, not just playing churches and drawing thousands, but you know they were going into mainstream venues. At that point, very few other Christian bands that I'm aware of that of that time were playing the kind of caliber gigs they were. Right, and it was, and internationally, it was just blowing up, wasn't it? Tens of thousands of people yeah. in places like South America ministering. I mean, when they first came out, I'll be honest. When King of Fools came out, I was listening to things like OK Computer and and Blur's eponymous album and all this kind of fairly angular left field indie rock. I didn't think much of it. I thought it was a bit tame. It was a bit, oh, a Christian version of rock and indie. Then they put Mesomorphous out and everything changed. Because <laughs> I thought, no, genuinely, this is actually really good. Yes. And I would listen to this as an indie music connoisseur, little m- music militant kind of like an obnoxious it's, guy. It has. I, li- yeah. I loved it. It's been said that I think both Mesomorphous and Glow, those two albums, the, the more you listen to it, the more you hear more in it. You, you realize, yeah. oh, there's a violent part. Of they're dense. Before, they're dense a, stuff. It's the there was dense just a music. lot in there, a lot packed, packed into it. Brilliant production, brilliant musicianship, and the songwriting as well. Um, so uh, all that goes to say is imagine how excited I was to meet Martin Smith when I got to know Tim Jupp through the Big Church Day Out and he'd had Bosch come and play in Chaos Curb and I got to know him and, and managed to swing it that his Big Church Night in tours would come to my church where I was, BCC because a nice big building, you know so so Martin Smith turns up and I'd met him once before uh, and he was brilliant then and I got chatting a little bit but hadn't stayed in touch but this time I, I got to spend the day with him, really, just being his gopher, just running around, getting things for him and helping out as best I could. But I had this niggling question because, you know, my heart has always been to see Christian musicians communicating love out in the mainstream venues. And I said, Martin, what are you doing about playing outside of the church? And he just stopped what he was doing and he said, nothing. I love leading worship. I'm all over it. I love it. But there's a big part of me, I just wouldn't be out there singing over people right, again. Yeah. And I said, well, I work in pubs. If I booked a pub, would you come and play? Yeah. And he just looked at me and said, let's keep talking. And he gave me his email address. And I waited probably six weeks. And then I emailed him saying, okay, how about it? What about our book? Two or three pubs over a weekend and you come and play. And he said, come down to my house and we'll talk about it. So I went down and it ended up being this tour, this like 12 date national tour in, in venues like the Cavern in Exeter and um, we played Asylum in Birmingham and the Fleece and Firkin in Bristol and Night and Day Cafe in in Manchester where like Oasis cut their teeth and quite well known little indie venues, you know, and most of the shows sold out and people came out the church came out as it were to sing these God's great dance floor type stuff and some old delirious stuff too. And so my career highlight hasn't really been about my music so much. It's actually been having the honor of being part of Martin's journey. And that whole thing turned into the army of bones band and the album that he put out as army of bones. So to have a small influence on your hero's career has been mental, like amazing. I've loved, loved, loved being a part of that. And, uh, you know, he he thinks of me as a real trouble, sort of troublemaker, because I, <laughs> I kind of provoked him to go and do that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I still have huge respect for him. Um, but, I mean, f- from my own career-wise, music-wise that I've made, I've just loved the freedom. Being an independent artist such as I am, I mean, I've worked with independent labels and things, but... I just absolutely love the chance to make music. And even if three or four people care, I'll still make music for them. Mm. I make music for me mainly. It's, yeah. a, it's a therapy for me.
inside my pain My confusion inside my fear Inside my doubt Inside my darkness Inside my love the freedom to make raucous out there indie rock and then electronic music and I'm, I'm a, definitely a, a jack of all trades I'm not a master of any of them but every time every time I release something it's a real buzz yeah and I love playing I love playing abroad I was yeah. in Hong Kong last year Amazing. all that kind of stuff is just it's all magical man <laughs> I love it and the worst day to know it's kind of bittersweet when a band finishes so the the night we finished Bosch, sold out hometown gig, it was extraordinary. But it was like one of those things, it's just, it was too good in as much as it takes so, so much to top that. that that's probably why we'll never touch it again. Mm. Um, but... I mean, I've had clangers. I've broken three strings during one gig. <laughs> in fact, that happened just before Christmas. I was playing in a oh, pub. No. Broke three strings on the one guitar. I was stupid. I only took one guitar. <sighs> broke three strings in like the first 15 minutes. Wow. So I did. That's impressive. I, How I did, did you manage that? I did an hour and three quarters with just three strings. <laughs> but everyone was so drunk in the pub. They didn't <laughs> care. That's the benefit of some of these situations. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that, I was like sweating the whole way through, <laughs> thinking how... How am I getting through this on three strings? That's impressive, both that you broke them so quickly and that you managed to get through it. I'm, I am impressed. <laughs> um, so where can people go if they want to hear more from you? Um, oh, well, these days, it's all about the old Spotify and Apple Music and iTunes and sort of search for Dave Griffiths. You'll find my music and Chaos Curve Collaboration and Bosch. You can search all of those things, any streaming service, any download service. They will you can find, find you. Yeah, Dave, music. Dave Griff .net. Well, Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for talking. It's been a real joy to have you in Bournemouth. Thanks very, very much. I'm Sam Hales. You're listening to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. That was my interview with the musician and singer-songwriter Dave Griffiths. Do hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to check out more interviews with leading Christians, you can do two things. The first thing you can do is download the Profile podcast. This show is available every week as a podcast, meaning you can listen to it on the go. Just search for The Profile on whatever podcast provider you use or go to premierchristianradio.com forward slash the profile. That's the first thing. The second thing you can do is you can get yourself a free copy of Premier Christianity magazine. This is a monthly magazine that features interviews with all sorts of interesting Christians, both in the UK and abroad. If you'd like to get the latest issue, which is actually a dedicated magazine all to Billy Graham, paying tribute to the legendary evangelist, you can go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. And we'd be delighted to send you that special tribute edition of the magazine. It's a hundred pages long. Not only is there lots of material dedicated to Billy Graham and an interview with his successor, Franklin Graham, but there's also loads of great Easter content in the latest issue of Premier Christianity magazine. Just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Thanks for being part of the show for the past hour. It's been great to have you with us. Coming up next though here on Premier Christian Radio is Premier Playback.